Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Plato webinar on reporting season and what is the outlook for retirement income. Look, we're also going to cover off the recent market volatility and some of the impacts of coronavirus. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Mark Cormack. I'm a director with Pinnacle Investment. Pinnacle are equity partners and work alongside Plato to distribute Plato's Australian and global income funds to the financial advisory marketplace. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Don Hampson, who's Plato's founder and managing director. As a bit of background, Plato specifically manage high income solutions for low tax investors, such as retirees. And this is very different to most fund managers who manage money for clients in all different tax brackets, which makes it very hard to optimise an income and total return. And in addition, because CGT is no impediment for low tax investors, one of Plato's strategies is to actively rotate through dividends to deliver high income. The outcome is that the Plato Australian shares income has delivered over 9% income since inception, and the Plato Global Shares Income Fund has delivered over 6% income. And it's important to note that Plato have achieved this result in a fairly torrid market for traditional income investors with the likes of banks and in Australia here Telstra underperforming the index significantly over the last couple of years. So turning to Plato's presentation today, it should last around 15 to 20 minutes and that'll be followed by a Q&A. All attendees have the opportunity to ask questions via the internet and this can be done by clicking the questions tab on your screen. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Plato's Managing Director and Founder, Dr. Don Hanson, for today's presentation. Thanks, Don. Thank you, Mark, and welcome, uh, listeners. <clears throat> so we began the year with interest rate expectations uh, that there'd be at least one more cut here in Australia, and indeed we've already seen that expectation met, uh, the RBA cut rates by 25 basis points to half percent on the 3rd of March. Um, and we expect, and the market expects, that there'll probably be another 25 basis point cut in the near future, but uh, this is due to the impact of coronavirus. But look, this wasn't unexpected because even last year, <coughs> excuse me, the um, uh, Philip Lowe was saying that he expected interest rates to remain low for a long period of time. I think the coronavirus has just meant they will be a little bit lower still uh, for a long time. And the impact of that, and this is actually a slide that we have updated to um, the 4th of March to take into account the RBA's latest interest rate cut. Um, we looked at the real return on safe, if you like, assets, such as overnight cash, one-year term deposit, or a 10-year government bond. And uh, those have dropped dramatically with that latest cut in interest rates. And, but even before the latest cut, um, the returns or the real returns, that is re uh, returns after inflation on these so-called safe assets were actually negative. So if you allow for headline inflation, which is currently running at about 1.8%, the yields on all the safe assets in the Australian market, pretty much every market around the world, are now less than inflation. So indeed, um, <clears throat> following the rate cut, um, you will now see that overnight cash in Australia at half percent uh, is 1.3% below the rate of inflation, and that means if you had a million dollars, you will be going backwards by $13,000 over the course of the year after allowing for inflation. Wow. Now, <clears throat> the impact of that on uh, for retirees who are investing in safe assets is that if you've got a negative real rate of return, in fact, we've only used half a percent, not 1.3%, because uh, we think things will will probably get a little better over, over, over the next <laughs> five to 10 years. But uh, if you have a, a, even a small negative real rate of return, a uh, million dollars is likely to uh, not see a, a, a couple through retirement, uh, particularly if they're not able to access the age pension if they've got other assets and holiday homes that don't create income. Um, but if you can lift that return to just something like 4% real, which would be like a balanced fund, then that should see, uh, you know, um, avoid longevity risk, if you like, for uh, retirees. So it is a very tough period out there for retirees. It's good to see today that uh, the government has actually adjusted down the deeming rates. Um, against this backdrop, it's interesting that, and even uh, in the reporting season uh, that's just passed, we see that dividends have been remarkably stable at an index level. They do vary a lot at the stock level. 
But the yield on the Australian market is still around that 6% mark. In fact, uh, it's sort of probably got a little lower than that uh, at the market peak, but now with the market coming back, we still think the gross yield of the Australian market this year will be something around 6%, which is obviously substantially more than the half percent for cash rates. And indeed, uh, you know, in these troubled times, we saw actually 10-year Commonwealth bonds get down to uh, only 55 basis points this week. So. Uh, pretty interesting times. And um, if we look at, uh, and this is history, it's not, it's not necessarily illustrative of uh, future returns, but if you look back over the last 14 and a half years, um, you know, the Australian market has generated some reasonable, say, some very good income. In fact, the, the cash return, or, uh, or sorry, the capital return on the Australian market hasn't been all that flash over the last 14, 15 years. It's only something like uh, a little under 3% per annum, but when you add the uh, cash dividends to that, it rises to 7.5% per annum. And for retirees who still get a full refund of franking credits, at least on their first $1.6 million worth of pension age, uh, pension phase super, uh, the total return has been around 9%. And indeed, that franking credit yield has been very stable around 1.5% to 1.6% per annum, which is actually now three times the cash rate. So um, just shows you the importance of those franking credits, which I've always called to be the icing on the cake. Now, um, just looking at the reporting season that has just come by here in Australia, uh, the, it was a very similar season to uh, last August. Uh, themes are very similar. Um, Retail has been struggling, but JB Hi-Fi has been a standout in what's been a tough uh, sector. Uh, ResMed and CSL and, and, uh, have been strong performers in the healthcare area, uh, and the iron ore miners have really probably been the standout uh, from both uh, income and or earnings and dividends, with, uh, again, further rises in the dividends of the likes of BHP, Rio, and particularly Fortescue Metal. Um, <clears throat> it was a solid result from CBA. Uh, they are the only bank not to have cut their dividend, uh, and they're leaving it at $2, and indeed uh, they did indicate there may be a uh, capital return sometime in the near future, although clearly with market uh, volatility they might postpone that. Uh, but it wasn't all smooth sailing. Um, you know, you had complete dividend cuts to zero from the likes of AMP and Blackmores. Uh, and uh, Whitehaven Coal cut its dividend by 90%. But if we if we look across the market rather than at individual stocks, it actually wasn't such a bad reporting season. I think probably the median dividend is the best thing to look at, and the median growth was actually zero. So you can actually say, well, gee, dividends are about the same level they were 12 months ago. But that's you know they haven't gone backwards in an environment when everyone's particularly concerned and when interest rates are actually falling, so your earnings from interest related uh, things or anything related to bank bills, linked to bank bills or the cash rate have gone down, dividends have still remained uh, okay and indeed, um, depending on how you cut the dividends, if you actually exclude specials which were very big last year, um, for some companies actually the dividends have actually risen but again I think the median number is the best one to look at and that's pretty much flat year on year. Um, Interestingly, if we take 2019 as a year and we look at the, um, both the Australian and the global market, we've seen strong growth in dividends over the last 12 months. Uh, we do a quarterly report <coughs> on global dividends and uh, in the last 12 months, uh, 2019 dividends increased about 11% globally uh, and this is developed markets only. And, uh, Companies in developed markets paid over two trillion Australian dollars in dividends in the last 12 months, 11.4% uh, more than they paid uh, in 2018. So we've actually seen some pretty strong dividend growth uh, at a total market level over the last 12 months. But of course, that's all looking back, and I think everyone here is uh, worried about current situations and uh, the C word, which is the coronavirus. And so we've got a few stats there and. I think the, um, this chart is quite indicative of what's happened. Uh, here we plot the total, we've been following this since, uh, in fact, uh, early, um, mid or late January. We're plotting the total cases, uh, new cases, as reported uh, this 
largely comes from John Hopkins University, but also uh, well-known leaders have a coronavirus number. And we're plotting the uh, change in cases, in uh, new cases in China versus the change in the rest of the world. This is a percentage change. So we're looking at a, how that goes. Now, um, China, China's change peaked early or, or in uh, late January. And indeed, to us, it was pretty clear that by around the end of the first week in February, which was two weeks after they started their lockdown, that uh, things were getting a lot better and the rate of change of the spread of the virus in China was actually uh, falling significantly. You can see that that's fallen virtually to zero now. Um, there have been very few new cases in China in the last uh, couple of weeks. The light blue line, though, looks at the change for the rest of the world, and this is what is worry, has been worrying markets since the last week of February, in that we have seen that the change in the rest of the world is remaining remarkably high, and uh, although there's a bit of measurement area that error in some of these things, but it's remained remarkably high around 20% uh, per day, uh, you know, so that's day on day. So it's, that is what has been worrying markets, particularly in... Italy, Iran, and South Korea have been the big countries, but we are seeing numbers build in the rest of continental Europe, and that is what is, is uh, troubling world markets, because I think up until uh, late February, people thought this was a China issue, and it wasn't really a big deal for, for the world. Um, and it's interesting, a lot of the initial commentary uh, about the virus was that the virus was actually a supply issue that, um, you know, we were people who were worried about whether they could get their iPhones out of China or they could get spare parts out of China or car, man, car, car parts out of China. Whereas in the last uh, couple of weeks, it's been very clear to us that this is coronavirus is not just a supply issue with worrying about global supply chains, but it is very much a demand issue as we are seeing in, in a number of industries, such as tourism-related industries, you know, airlines, hotels, discretionary spending, and, uh, and oil prices, and hence oil stocks, that demand has slowed dramatically in the last month or so, uh, and that is likely to impact stocks in those sectors. And there are also secondary effects uh, because the banks caved into the political pressure to pass on the full 25 basis point rate cut in, uh, in March. Uh, the impact on bank earnings from that decision will probably be the 3 to 5 percent earnings decline. There are also some less obvious impacts of coronavirus, and these came out of the reporting season where companies said they could, their earnings could be impacted. For instance, Blackmore's, which had an awful result anyway and cut its dividend to zero, it actually pre-warned that it would virtually make nothing in the second half which is of, of this financial year, which is the June half, um, because uh, a lot of the sales of vitamins to China, China, uh, 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 are to China and Chinese tourists, and obviously we know that Chinese tourists are not coming to Australia. There is currently a travel ban. <coughs> Cochlear is another one which you wouldn't necessarily think may be affected by the coronavirus, but uh, cochlear is a world leader in ear implants, but those implants do actually need to be implanted within the inner ear um, or the cochlear by, um, in a, in a full-scale uh, hospital operation. And with the coronavirus uh, impacting hospitals around the world, firstly in China, but now in, in Italy and Iran and South Korea and other countries, um, the likelihood of elective surgery in those hospitals uh, is very low for the, for, for the next few months, and so Cochlear announced that its sales to China would tr slow dramatically because there would be uh, a, ver a lack of elective surgery, but that will now spread across, I think, other jurisdictions. What I haven't mentioned is iron ore, and uh, whilst there's been a lot of speculation about the impact on iron ore miners, um, Notably, iron ore prices have held up very well. Indeed, the commentary in the last two days from, from the likes of Fortescue Metal is that uh, steel demand is still strong, steel um, uh, mills in China are still producing very rapidly. They didn't really slow down, uh, and uh, they were sort of away, largely away from the affected uh, area near Wuhan. 
um, and that uh, you know they are still very um, uh, confident. And uh, you know we expect actually that uh, China, as it tries to stimulate its economy out of this crisis, uh, that China will need to put the foot down on infrastructure spending, and that will be good for for steel prices and iron ore production, and obviously iron ore miners. And that brings us to the policy response across um, the uh, world, and that policy response is a moving feast. I mean, we've now seen the RBA here uh, cut 25 basis points. We saw the Fed do an emergency out of cycle cut by 50 basis points. We saw the Bank of Canada and the Bank of England over, well, Bank Canada a couple of days ago, and the Bank of England overnight cut their rates by 50 basis points. Um, albeit, I think the Bank of England is about is about where, where we are. It's probably going to be close to the end of its cycle, but there are expectations the Fed can continue to cut. Um, we saw a big stimulus package in the UK overnight, and we see another big one here, effectively equal to 1.2 percent of GDP, announced this morning. Uh, you know, the Australian stimulus package would be uh, 17.6 billion. Spent largely this financial year, uh, pensioners, the unemployed, and uh, family tax benefit recipients will receive $750 by the end of this month, uh, a once-off payment. There will be uh, some immediate write-offs for uh, companies if you invest in a plant and equipment up to $150,000 for well, small, medium, and even you know, reasonable-sized companies. Uh, that's if you invest before 30th of June, and the deeming rates uh, will fall by half a percent, amongst other things. <clears throat> so we see significant stimulus and uh, late news. You may have seen um, the US is starting to announce some initiatives, including, uh, which is uh, in fact probably negative for markets today, but uh, they have actually banned travel between Europe and, uh, and the US, which uh, will obviously affect uh, airlines and, and, and certain things. So um, a lot is happening, um, a huge amount of stimulus because this isn't just a health issue, it is actually affecting the real economy. Um, but I would say that in terms of outlook, we do expect this virus, in fact, to be temporary. Sharp, but temporary. Um, it is a type of flu. Flu season peaks in the winter. It's just coming out of the northern winter now. So you would expect that this thing will, um, that this thing will start to dissipate as the northern hemisphere warms up. Um, but we do expect volatility to continue until the global trends start to improve. So we need to start to see those global trends, not Chinese, because they've already uh, improved significantly, but we need to see some improvement in the rate of change of uh, what's happening outside of China. Um, earnings will be impacted for a, across a range of stocks, and we've talked about some of those. Um, <clears throat> so, But it will be short and sharp and temporary. Uh, however, uh, it's very important in this sort of thing, if stocks uh, do have a sharp loss in earnings, that may mean they'll cut the dividends, and so it's all, uh, more important, I think, than ever to avoid the weak companies which, be, which may become dividend traps. We've also done a stress test of our portfolio to ensure that we don't have any stocks in our portfolio that are heavily geared and may need to do a deeply discounted rights issue. Uh, or, or have trouble with their bankers, so I think it's important to stress test your portfolio. Um, but I would say, you know, on the positive side, to me, um, if you actually look at the numbers, uh, yes, the, you know, the, it is a pandemic, and, and who has actually come out and called it a pandemic? But for most people, um, most healthy people under 50, um, the mortality rate is way below 1%. It's quite tiny. The number of people that have died so far is actually tiny relative to the number of people who globally die in a normal flu season. Hundreds of thousands of people die in a normal flu season, and we're only talking, you know, four, four, four and a half thousand, or you know, moving towards five thousand here. So it's actually a very small number relative to normal flus. Um, obviously, the very old are most at risk. Uh, the mortality rates over 80 are something in the range of 15 to 20 percent, which is quite high. So the old people are the ones that are at risk. But I would say that there are already um, over a dozen groups produce, um, developing vaccines, and two have already been developed, one here in Australia from the University of Queensland. Now, obviously, these need to be tested, and if they pass the test, they need to be developed in commercial uh, quantities. But things are happening on that side of things, and 
you know, governments around the world are providing a lot of funding for their health departments uh, to overcome this virus. So, you know, we don't, you know, we think the panic is actually worse than the pandemic and, uh, you know, uh, we are taking all precautions ourselves to ensure that we are uh, stress tested our portfolio and our company. Uh, as, a, as an example of, of that, uh, we tested last week, uh, last Friday, the whole Plato team worked from home. We have no problems at doing that, so we believe if there is a lockdown or those sorts of things that uh, we will still be managing the portfolio as usual. Fantastic, Don, and always great to get your views on, on income investing. Just acknowledging we did have a, a slight uh, outage on the visuals there, but uh, hopefully you could hear us all the way, and our great friends, our marketing team, will send out the slides uh, straight after this. But you didn't miss anything in terms of slides. We were um, we were talking of those slides as, uh, as we went through. So just a reminder that all attendees today do have the opportunity to ask questions via the internet, and this can be done by clicking that questions tab on your screen. While you've been... While you were talking, Don, we did have some come in. So, um, Don, iron ore prices have held up well in a volatile market. Can the iron ore sector maintain its high payouts and dividends that we saw last year? I think most definitely. I mean, in fact, Fortescue Metal significantly increased its dividends. It only paid 65% of its earnings out. Uh, it basically has uh, got, you know, got cash equal to its net debt, so basically is debt-free. Um, those iron ore miners are very uh, profitable at current iron ore prices, and iron ore prices haven't moved off very much at all. Um, as I said earlier, that uh, we would expect that part of the Chinese stimulus uh, uh, will involve uh, continued expenditure on infrastructure, which means steel. Good story there for iron ore miners. So turning to banks, another question here. Don, can you see banks withdrawing lending across the market. I suppose we saw that in the GFC where banks kind of froze up a bit. Would that limit their ability to maintain dividends? Well, so far, this the, the differentiation here was a financial crisis in the GFC and there was uh, incredible tightening within credit markets. That is not the case now. Uh, and uh, in fact, central banks have been incredibly accommodative in terms of adding liquidity. So we aren't seeing that uh, that liquidity crisis or that withdrawal of credit at the moment. Uh, so uh, you know, I think uh, that is that is not something that we are seeing. Okay, Don. Um, another question here: with competition within telcos dropping uh, and Telstra stripping out costs at the moment, what's the outlook for their dividend? They've obviously had a pretty hard time uh, on on the stock market the last couple of years. Yeah, a little, little bit better in a sense lately, but um, look, we can't see any any sign they're going to increase their dividends. And remember, they've already cut it by 48%. Mm. I mean, the problem for Telstra is they still make a lot of money or technically make a lot of money by um, being paid for uh, uh, paid for each house that the NBN uh, signs up. And uh, as those NBN payments roll off, there is still a hole in, in uh, Tel Telstra's earnings. So... Um, I think at best, the best outcome would be that Telstra uh, uh, probably maintains its dividend, but given that it's still paying a special dividend, I think there's still a likelihood that that special might actually uh, drop away over time, in which case still the dividend cuts from Telstra will actually be actually higher than the 48% that's currently. Mm -hmm. So I'm, not, I'm still not uh, that positive on Telstra's dividend outlook. Yep. Um, Don, uh, top of the question, oil prices, given what's happening at the moment with oil prices in Saudi and Russia, um, what are your preferred exposures there and um, <coughs> any dividend traps, I suppose? Yeah, I mean, the oil's, oil is pretty complicated because it's actually, you know, it's, it's uh, a couple of things happening. First is we have seen, because it is a demand shock uh, associated with the coronavirus, e.g. no one's driving a car in in China, you've seen the pictures of the roads and there's virtually no cars on the roads, so there's suddenly been a massive reduction in demand, particularly out of China, for oil. Um, and we already had sort of like a glut of supply and uh, Russia and Saudi Arabia, neither of them, they don't want to cut, they want to keep producing. So we have got excess supply relative to demand, but if uh, we are correct in the view that this is a short, sharp downturn and things will get back to normal later in the year, particularly in China, as they seem to have been over their problems, um, then we'll see dem the demand in increasing and that hopefully should stabilise prices in, in the oil effect, bring prices back up a bit. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, Don. Um, have companies exhausted their cash on balance sheets with buybacks and specials in the last 12 months? Um, and would we expect a lower dividends going forward um, out of the Aussie market? Well, I think we we we, we have been saying that look, was a dividend bonanza uh, financial year 2019. Uh, there were a number of special dividends. There were a number of buybacks associated with uh, companies such as Rio BHP and and uh, uh, Woolworth selling things and Coles, uh, West Farmers selling Coles. Um, so without that impetus from that, without the impetus of the ALP policy, which was threatening potential franking credit refunds, um, we would expect not dividends to fall anyway and those special dividends to roll off. Um, I think given current uncertainty in markets, there will also, that's another thing which, which and has already affected uh, Qantas. I mean, unfortunately, um, Qantas had announced a buyback only three, four weeks ago and pulled it uh, just yesterday or two days ago when they announced uh, some significant changes, cutting routes uh, and cancellation of that tax effective buyback. So clearly, I think in this fairly uncertain world, companies that want to keep their cash, so I don't think there'll be too much. There was some in expectation that Commonwealth Bank may do a, uh, a return of capital or buyback mid-year. Again, given the uncertainty, that's probably less likely right now, but you never know. I mean, if the uh, if these vaccines come out quicker than we expect, uh, it could be over by, by mid-year if, if we have vaccines uh, being produced quicker. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's all we do have time for today. We, we will wrap the presentation up. If we didn't get to your question, we'll, we'll certainly respond on, on email. Plato's uh, Global and Australian Share Income Funds are available on most platforms and our marketing team will be making the webinar available on the Plato Investment website, which is www.platoplato.com.au and that'll be available later today. We'd certainly like to thank you for your time and for your participation today, some great questions. And if you have any further inquiries, please do not hesitate to contact the Plato website or the Pinnacle distribution team. Thanks again, and uh, we look forward to speaking with you either in person at your office, at our next event, or on the next webinar. Thank you very much, and have a nice day.